Welcome to Cross Question, LBC's thrice weekly political panel debate show. I'm reintroducing the word thrice into the English language, not before time. Uh, we have a great panel for you tonight, although we are one short because Susie Boniface's uh, internet keeps going down. The Fleet Street Fox has obviously bitten through the cables, but we are going to see if we can get her in a moment. But joining me now live are Sir David Liddington, the former Deputy Prime Minister under Theresa May, Siobhan McDonough, Labour. MP for Mitcham and Morden, and Robert Shrimsley, Chief Political Commentator for the Financial Times. They're here to take your calls. The number to call 0345 6060 973. Obviously, I suspect most of your calls will be about Dominic Cummings and his evidence today. But if you want to phone in on anything else, feel free as well. You can watch us. Global Player is the place to go. The LBC website, YouTube feed or social media feeds. Well, let's get going. 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And Natalie in Taunton has the first question. Natalie, hi, what would you like to ask? Hello. Um, I would like hi. to ask is Dominic Cummings right? that Mr Johnson is not fit to be Prime Minister? And if so, why aren't any Tory MPs speaking out? Um, David Lindsay, I think I have to come to you first. Um, what's your response to Natalie's question? Well, he's Prime Minister because he was elected, first of all, by uh, my party. But, but more importantly, his premiership was endorsed with a thumping majority by the electorate in the December 2019 general election. So... I mean, to be quite honest, whether I or anybody else, you know, has a particular assessment on it, and I, you know, it's not a secret. I didn't vote for him. I voted for Jeremy Hunt in the final election. Um, he has the public's mandate through the election. Um, I think that uh, what comes out of today is that um, the government really ought to press forward with the independent inquiry. We've heard, we've heard a, a case for the prosecution. Uh, today, and I don't leap to judgment, certainly not on individuals, uh, until I've heard all the witnesses, all the evidence. Uh, and I'm sure the select committee will have taken other evidence, listened to other people, um, and will probably want to write to ministers to ask um, them to respond to what Mr Cummings said today. But the sooner we get this in front of a proper public inquiry with everybody um, putting their accounts and recollections on the table, the better. Do, do you think that um, after this evidence, it, it means that maybe the, there is a case for bringing forward the date of the commencement of the inquiry, which the Prime Minister thinks should be next spring? But I wonder whether that should now be brought forward a little bit. Yeah, I, I, would, I would bring it forward. I mean, I think it's a pity it hasn't been started already, because I'm actually not terribly interested in uh, trying to pin blame on individuals or organisations. So if I look around the rest of Europe... North America, you know, Canada, United States, you know, every government's made mistakes. Um, I think our government would be in a better position if they had said from the start, yeah, we, we have made some mistakes. We go along, we've tried our best, but um, this was a novel virus and we haven't got everything right. Um, and I think the public get that. Um, but um, so I, I, what the inquiry needs to establish is what we can learn from this for the future, how we can reform our system of government, reform our pandemic preparation, our resilience to surge extra staff in where they're needed in another emergency. Learn those lessons, because this is not going to be the last pandemic or crisis that we face. But what do you make of the fact that, uh, I mean, a lot of people consider Dominic Cummings effectively the Deputy Prime Minister, but like you were under Theresa May. The, this was almost a case of, I mean, if you had gone in front of a select committee and said that Theresa May wasn't fit to be Prime Minister, I mean, that would have been uh, quite something. Uh, he's done that today, saying Boris Johnson wasn't, not only was he not fit to be Prime Minister, he wasn't fit to be his Chief Advisor either, which is uh, quite something for him to say. I, I mean, I, I've, I've never heard a government advisor like Dominic Cummings say anything like this it's got to be damaging to the Prime Minister hasn't it oh I mean clearly he has made very serious allegations against both the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary um, and they deserve the opportunity to respond to those I mean I for that reason I'm I, I, you know, not gonna get drawn too much into the charges against individuals except 
except to say that the picture of Matt Hancock that, that Dominic Cummings uh, painted today was very different from my experience of working with Matt Hancock as a colleague in the Cabinet and in Parliament, where I found him, you know, a, a, a good, hard-working uh, and honest colleague. Um, the I think, though, that um, it is astonishing that a senior advisor sort of having, hangs around his art demands as a condition of his appointment that he gets you know executive powers to basically run number 10 and direct the center of government as he chooses on the prime minister's behalf and and then he turns around and says oh well, actually I, I i never had any confidence in the prime minister all the way along like oh i couldn't get my my own way so i think there's some you know of public inquiry should be asking, I would imagine, some further questions of Mr Cummings. And I felt that one of the key elements that we do need to learn from this is, is ministers. You, you said, if I denounced Theresa May when I was a uh, number two, yes, it would have been on the front page. Um, um, <laughs> Were you tempted? I, I, I would no, no, and I and I I, 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 I work on I worked on the basis that you have 100% loyalty outside the room, and you try and have 100% candour with your boss inside the room. That's what any prime minister needs. Yeah. There's too few people around a prime minister who tell them unwelcome uh, truths and disagree with them in private. Um, uh, but minister, you can't give power to cut through red tape in Whitehall just to unelected advisers. Ultimately, it has to be a minister, and uh, perhaps a minister appointed with uh, sort of delegated power by the PM of the day to write this and a particular project. Um, because it's the ministers who are elected and the ministers who are accountable to the people's representatives in Parliament, not not advisers. Okay. Um, Siobhan McDonough, I'm, I'm sure you're tempted to use the phrase rats in a sack here, and I, I'm just trying to imagine how the country would have reacted if um, maybe Alastair Campbell had done this. I know he wasn't Deputy Prime Minister, but I mean, a lot of people thought he was. Um, that's the nearest equivalent I can think of going in front of a set committee and denouncing Tony Blair in, in this way. What, what do you draw from today beyond the normal party political knockabout? Just we live in extraordinary times. <laughs> I mean, the thing that I have to say that I found myself nodding to, and this is going to get me a lot, in, a lot into a lot of trouble for saying, when he said it comes to something when we give the British people the choice of Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn, um, because we as Labour, you know, we have some responsibility for this. Um, I think we let the people down um, during the period of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and we've allowed an incompetent, dangerous government um, into power. Um, that's done some pretty shocking things. And I, I completely understand that, you know, um, Dominic Cummings is damaged goods and it's a bit of a circus, but he did say things, things today that made me feel quite ill because I know they're true. And that is the stuff about um, elderly and disabled people uh, being transferred from hospital to care homes without being tested. I know that happened because all that time I had stories from pretty desperate constituents telling me about their loved ones that that happened to. I had doctors and nurses tell me about the lack of PPE and the fact that the PPE was out of date. They got labels saying, you know, it should have been used a year ago, 18 months ago. So when I was listening to that, I know that's true. But he, he seemed to be, certainly, I, I didn't see all of it, but I saw about two to three hours of it. And there were various stages there. Where I thought, oh, mate, you were right in the centre of things. You had the power yeah. to not just yeah. influence, but to change things. And yet you're talking as if you were a commentator. Um, yes. Uh, and perhaps he's looking back with a bit of remorse on his part for his involvement. Um, and... Um, not having made his case or, I mean, wasn't it David Cameron who called him a career psychopath? Mm. Uh, and, you know, both Boris Johnson um, and Dominic Cummings are extraordinary people. Um, and these are extraordinary things that have been said in extraordinary times. But I think most people, they just want life to get back to normal. They want to feel that they and their families are safe. So in a way, these are debates for another time. Um, uh, Robert so Shrimsley. they won't have the same impact as they would normally. Okay. 
Um, Robert Shrimsley, have the political tectonic plates changed at all today? I'm inclined to say no. <clears throat> I mean, I think if you really strip away all the fizzing hyperbole and the score settling and some of you know, the fantastic theatre of this committee hearing, in the end, I don't think there was some great revelation. There were some, some interesting morsels, but no great revelation that we didn't know already. And that's because the fundamentals of what happened in this crisis, what went wrong and what went right, are largely in the public domain. We know that there was a massive problem, failure to engage with it properly at the very start. And we know of the systemic failures. We know of the chaos with PPE. And we know of the inherited problems that can't be blamed on Boris Johnson, but on those governments that went before. And we know what happened in September when people were telling him that he needed to lock down more quickly and he didn't want to. So although there was lots and lots of interesting, you know, interesting detail, which I'm sure an inquiry will pick it pick, pick up on, I don't know that we fundamentally discovered anything new. The story of this pandemic is, is out there and we know it. So, I mean, Boris Johnson has got to be damaged by a lot, some of this. I mean, that, that surely is, is a self-evident truth. But do you think that, that his Teflon qualities are going to come to the fore again and that next week, instead of an 18-point Conservative lead, we might see a 20-point Conservative lead? Because th this is a political phenomenon, isn't it? Well, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of my, my, my career writing about politics, explaining when, how, how Boris Johnson has got to be damaged by something that he seems to emerge <laughs> from um, un, un, unscathed. So you know, I'm, I'm fairly well burnt on this one. I'm not going to say that. I mean, I, I actually think he may well be fine in the short term out of this because... Um, Dominic Cummings is, Cummings is a fairly discredited messenger. Um, the public aren't, even even the people who are interested in this, you know, are not necessarily persuaded by him and they can see his score settling. People have largely made up their minds on Boris Johnson already. The people who think he's been disastrous, thought he was disastrous before this pandemic ever occurred. Um, and the people who support him largely were those um, who, who did before. On top of which, you know, he's had the vaccine success, he had the furlough scheme. The people who aren't, you know, unrelentingly hostile to the Prime Minister, I think, have either decided that, you know, he did the best he could, or that nobody else would have done any better, and actually they want to look forward rather than back. So I, I'm, I'm not convinced yet that I do see anything that terribly damages him that we didn't know before. 30 seconds each. Put yourself in Matt Hancock's head tonight. What's going on in your head, David Liddington? Um, preparing um, what he's going to say to the House of Commons tomorrow in answer to the urgent question that Labour Party opposition frontbenchers put down. And I gather he's fronting up a press conference at number 10 tomorrow as well, thinking, what do I need to, to say then? And you know, how to get the balance right between um, responding to the allegations that Cummings made and actually trying to maintain the focus on I think Robert, Robert, all right. What what people are, are most interested in, which is you know, some hope that we are on our way out of the worst of this pandemic. Okay, Siobhan. I don't think his press conference is much of a problem to him. I think he will just concentrate um, on the uh, great story, which is uh, vaccinations. Though that's problematic and in my constituency we've discussed before Ian some of the people who are not taking the vaccine that we need to worry about so I think he'll concentrate on that um I think I think he uh, I don't think he'll be too troubled about it at all just because Dominic Cummings is discredited though he has done some pretty terrible things and the elderly people who were discharged from hospitals are the top of it okay Robert well, I think he might be tempted to phone Mark Sedwell and ask if he did actually say uh, that he uh, 15 or 20 <laughs> times he thought the health secretary should be sacked. Um, I think he might be reflecting briefly on that tweet he sent in support of Dominic Cummings during the Barnard Castle quite, trip, yeah. wondering whether that was necessarily wise. Um, I, I think he'll be a little bit more worried, actually. I mean, it, Dominic Cummings, for all his for all the problems we've outlined, you know, he is a dangerous enemy. And if he's decided to go you know, hook, line and sinker after Matt Hancock, that's not necessarily good news for him. On the other See, hand, this is why, the, the, the way he went for him so phenomenally means he's probably unsackable at the moment. This yeah. is why you're chief political commentator. I get it. Absolutely. Question um, with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 
Uh, 8.20 on LBC. Joshua on Twitter says, Anyone ever noticed that Ian Dale and Rick Stein are the same person? They may only look similar, but they literally have the same voice. We also have Jack Russell's, but I don't like fish. Uh, we are delighted that Susie Boniface joins us now, the Fleet Street, Fleet Street Fox and Mirror columnist. Uh, welcome, Susie. Uh, welcome to the party. Hello. We're obviously talking a, a lot about, um, de- uh, about Dominic Cummings. Let's go to our next caller. Uh, Dave in Southwark, uh, yeah. would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, why didn't Matt Hancock resign and, and why wasn't he sacked, uh, you know? Okay. Um, well, Susie, let's come to you first. The question as to why he wasn't sacked, because um, according to Dominic Cummings, he was uh, up for sack, being sacking, uh, being sacked earlier and in the uh, first sort of end of lockdown in March, April time. Uh, and for some reason or another, Boris Johnson protected him at that point despite the fact that obviously Cummings and others are, are on his ear hole about him and saying Matt Hancock is telling porky pies about care homes and so on. The fact that he's, you know, I think only Boris Johnson can answer is why on earth he didn't sack him. But he hasn't, he has not sacked a lot of people. Pretty Patel, Dominic Cummings himself, who all arguably should have been sacked at some point in their tenure in Downing Street. Um, and Boris Johnson appears to want to protect those around him and those who are on his side at the expense of well, you know, common decency and basic morals more than anything else, never mind competence. But as to why he hasn't resigned today, that would be probably because why would you need to resign if you're never going to be sacked? Um, that, that's an interesting point, isn't it, David Leddington? Because all prime ministers want to protect their political allies. That's just, it goes with the job, I suppose. Um, Matt Hancock stood against Boris Johnson for the leadership. They've never, I don't think they've ever been particularly close. But Boris Johnson's big weakness, I've always thought, is that he wants to be liked. And sacking people is just not in his nature. It's not what he's very good at. And sometimes he then lives to regret it. Well, I, I, I don't think in my the sort of 28 years I spent in Parliament that there was any Prime Minister who actually enjoyed reshuffles and sackings. I mean, some were better at it than others. Um, but something goes wrong every time any leader has a reshuffle. <laughs> we, we saw it with, with Keir recently, you know, they, with Labour, but you get it, government and opposition alike. Um, people you, you've asked to move refuse to move. Um, uh, people go out and make a great big fuss and start attacking you. you um, somebody is appointed who then causes an uproar amongst some particular interest group or, or group on your back benches. So uh, prime ministers don't like shuffles unless it's the moment of their own choosing. But you know, the, all I can say is on the basis of you know my own experience. It's, it's when I worked with Matt, he was a a, a, a competent, very hardworking. Minister, you know, agree or disagree with his policies, that's another another matter entirely. Um, and he obviously maintains the confidence of the PM today, which is why he is still in office. And every minister serves for as long or short a time as the Prime Minister of the day wants him. You've been through a fair few reshuffles in your time. Did you ever refuse a job? No. No, I always took I, I always took it. When when David Cameron rang me up in twenty ten when he formed the coalition and said, um, David, I'd like you to go and do Europe. Um, I did say, um, yeah, of course, Prime Minister, you know, d- delighted to serve, but um, you do realise the last two roles you've given me have been Northern Ireland and the Middle East. I get all the easy stuff, don't I? Because um, <laughs> so, yeah. it, end, it, it ended so well. Um, Siobhan <laughs> McDonough. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you take the rough with the smooth. I mean, you know, the, who was it? Who was it? it was Enoch Powell who, who wrote that all, that all political careers end in failure. Yeah. Um, at some yes. stage. The important thing is to make sure that you've got other things in your life that matter. Um, Siobhan McDonough, what's your answer to Dave's question? Why hasn't Matt Hancock been fired or why hasn't he resigned yet? Well, if he's not going to, if the Prime Minister is not going to sack Gavin Williamson, the education secretary, he's not sacking nobody, is he? Uh, Because he's got to be the top of the tree for complete incompetence, not having any clue as to what he's doing and doing serious damage. Um, so I suspect that the Prime Minister doesn't sack people because he likes people who are not very good around him because it reflects well on him. Um, Robert Shrimp, so you'll notice that I've come to you last two questions running, which I don't normally do, but I like I like our Seems commentators to hear what... 
um, well, you, you talked about Matt Hancock in your previous answer. Um, we were talking to uh, uh, Westminster correspondent Ben Kentish earlier, and indeed um, to Sir Peter Bottomley. Uh, and the consensus here was that actually Matt Hancock's position has been strengthened today, bizarrely. Possibly. And I don't, I don't know if it's really been strengthened because he's the focus of attention and that's never necessarily welcome in these circumstances. I mean, the answer to the question, which is why hasn't he been sacked, um, is actually, I think, quite simple, which is that if you sack your health secretary in the middle of a health crisis, then you are saying that you have massively messed everything up. Uh, and that isn't the line that the government wants to offer us, uh, however much we may think it. Um, so I think the only moment when they could, where he could realistically have sacked Matt, Han Matt Hancock mid-crisis was in the first few weeks, when you say he's clearly not up to it. We've got to get someone better. Once he was, once he was there three, four, five months in, I think it was very difficult to move him without accepting a degree of culpability that the prime minister is not keen to accept. I, I think there's quite a high chance he'll be moved when the reshuffle eventually comes. Um, Susie, obviously you, you missed the first 15 minutes, but so what, what, what did you find Dominic Cummings a convincing witness today? Do you think that the fact he was there for seven hours rather than the original two and a half, did he, did he overplay his hand a bit? Was he believable? I'll quote one of my colleagues from the Mirror who wrote in the Mirror's politics newsletter this morning that he couldn't believe MPs were spending hours of their day taking evidence from an unreliable witness who operated on the fringes of normal human behaviour, um, which I think brilliantly sums up Dominic Cummings. But uh, it's one of the, what it's also, you can say it's like alien versus predator, you know, whichever one of them wins, we all lose because there is no particularly good outcome of Cummings versus Johnson or Hancock or anything else. There's, there's no one side you can really be cheering for. Um, so he was a different figure to the one we saw in the Rose Garden. He was, I took some of the things he said as more sincere because he wasn't um, protecting his job at that point. He was, he was uh, coming out with a, a fairly fulsome and sincere sounding apology. Although the, there was so again remarkable holes in his uh, explanation about security concerns and that was why they had to go to Durham to protect his family um, security concerns were mentioned at the time but when uh, a newspaper approaches somebody anybody about a story that they've been somewhere they shouldn't have been and there is an issue about security and safety of your family the one thing every Every single person who's a politician or a celebrity or anybody else, their press people has a conversation with the editor of that newspaper and says, well, look, this is a security thing. It's not as personal, it's private and so on. And a lot, there's no newspaper that wants to make someone's uh, safety more difficult these days or make someone less safe. So had that discussion taken been taken place, the story would have been very different if not done in quite the same way at all. So that discussion never happened. And the Mirror and the Guardian were having talks with Downing Street about the Durham story for weeks, weeks they had to manage this. So it was epically badly handled, if that is the genuine excuse. And we still don't know why it is, even if that is true, why he decided to leave his home in a two-ton lump of metal uh, discovery and go to Barnard Castle thinking he was half blind and couldn't walk. Because I think mean, anybody who gets behind the wheel with their child in the car in those circumstances certainly shouldn't be running the country, frankly. So there's still holes in it. There's still things to pick apart in what you said um i take it with a pinch of salt but i take it as well that there's an awful lot there that just sounds just about right doesn't it, it smells right boris johnson just reading the papers and then cannoning around downing street causing chaos people managing him out of cobra meetings because he would have been no help planning for a pandemic it all has the ring of truth to me um dave in southwark what, what, why do you think that matt hancock hasn't been fired um, I think uh, because you know, yeah, he's got ties to to the government, and um, in 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 my honest opinion, uh, I think that if uh, Labour, if they ever 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 hope uh, have a dream to to win a next uh, you know next general election, uh, even though if Dominic Cummins is damaged goods, they they should they should take him on as an advisor to to see if they could win the next general election. I mean. You know. Well, there's a thought. There's a thought, Siobhan. How do you fancy him on your team? Uh, no, uh, thanks, Dave. But I think I uh, think I would advise any leader to give him, leave him where he is. 
Give it, oh, he, he, he needs a bit of a shake up. He would give it a shake up, wouldn't he? Yeah. He, was, yeah. he would certainly do that. I mean, he's the ultimate you disruptor. Want, you could just give it a year and denounce your own leader. Cut out the middleman. <laughs> 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 right, Dave, thank you very much for that. We'll take more of your calls too. So, Dave. On LBC, call 0345 6060 973. It's 8.34 on LBC. We're taking your calls. Um, all the questions so far that I can see are on the Dominic Cummings evidence, which I'm not surprised by at all. We might try and fit a question in at the end that isn't on that, if anyone would like to uh, ask a question along those lines, but it's entirely up to you. Uh, with me are Sir David Ledington, the former de facto Deputy Prime Minister under Theresa May. I, I'm fed up with saying de facto. I always want to just say Deputy Prime Minister. I don't know why she couldn't have just majored that. It would have made us mu it made it much simpler for all of us. Uh, Siobhan McDonough, uh, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden, Robert Shrimsley, Chief Political Commentator for the Financial Times, and Susie Boniface, the Fleet Street Fox and Mirror columnist. Right, let's go to another question. It's Mike in Beverly. Hello, Mike. Hi, Ryan. Hi, what's your question, please? My question is, um, how much influence does the panel think that the Prime Minister's dog and girlfriend should have over number 10 during a COVID crisis? That's an interesting way of phrasing it. But, um, uh, Siobhan McDonough, um, Prime Minister's wives, partners, husbands over the years, they've, they've all had some degree of controversy at some point, haven't they? They do. And you, you must think that, you know, Carrie Simmons is a, a, a much younger woman, is going to get attract a lot of um, um criticism. She's clearly a political operator, having been a senior officer in the Conservative Party herself. Uh, so I think it's just a wonderful mix and storm and cauldron of stuff. As far as Dylan the dog goes, um, I'm not sure he's got that much impact on policy. Well, he was clearly a distraction for the Prime Minister on one or two occasions, but um, that's, what Jack, that's what you get if you have a Jack Russell, as I know only too well. Uh, Susie Boniface, um, do, do you think that Carrie Simmons attracts an unfair press? What kind of role should she have um, advising the Prime Minister as his partner? She was a director of uh, communications at Conservative campaign headquarters for some time, so clearly she's got a background in this. Why shouldn't he ask her opinion if he wants to? Exactly. I think we've got a slightly strange attitude towards, well, not slightly, very strange attitude towards women. Uh, in this country, in much of the, the Western world, it's slightly different to Scandinavian countries, but she is um, she is his partner, she is his helpmeet to whatever extent that happens. And if he's got problems and issues at work, like you, me, or anybody else, you have a right to come home and talk to your partner about it. And they have a right to say, oh God, why are you putting up with that? Or why are you doing this? Or, you know, have, calm down, have a cup of tea, whatever it might be. But you all have a chance to offer advice to one another in our normal relationships. Um, and if the person that you're asking that advice, if you're a lawyer and you're married to a lawyer, then they may offer you some kind of, you know, legal advice that is based upon their legal experience. That would be reasonable and fair enough. Um, I think it becomes difficult when the person in question uh, is elected and their partner obviously is not. But then you have all these problems, same as Hillary Clinton had uh, when she was first lady. Um, and to some extent, I think the royal family had the same thing, that uh, there is someone who is supposed to do the job and then there's someone else who comes along and marries them who's not supposed to do that job. And then if mm. they were to start expressing any kind of opinion, we go, well, hang on, that's not your place. And we tend to say that more about women. I really struggle, and it's been said a lot, actually, if Theresa May had been in the position that Boris Johnson is, had she cheated on Philip with a much younger man uh, and somehow or another they'd had a, a child out of wedlock, had her husband had cancer at the time and all the rest of this stuff happened, would she have emerged as unscathed as Boris Johnson has? And if she had done that, if Theresa May was in 10 Downing Street with a toy boy and a baby on the way, would anyone be saying, well, hang on, he shouldn't be telling her what to do if he was a former director of communications for the Tory party? They would say, well, of course she should be taking advice from her partner. But when it's the other way around, when the genders are switched, we go, hang on, Lady Macbeth's here. She's got him under her finger. She's got him under the thumb. She's telling him what to do. She's running the country. What does she know? She's evil, you know, and all right, she's not elected, but she's a fairly, she's on the sort of fairly moderate end of the Conservative Party. Uh, if she's doing anything to calm him down or rein him in, I'm hugely grateful to her. 
personally. Um, and if she's, you know, she's making him more friendly towards animals or whatever it might be, that's her personal bugbear, and if she's bending his ear about it, that's what we'd all do. If I was in a room with Boris Johnson, whether I was having an affair with him or not, whether I was mother is a child or not, I would say, mate, sort out the nuclear test veterans that I've been writing about for 20 years. I'd say, come on, sort this out, fix Brexit, do whatever it might be. Um, we'd all do that if we had his ear, and she's got his ear more often than anybody else. And let's face it, she has to put up with quite a lot in order to have access to that ear. So if she wants to get something out of it, I, you know, I don't mind too much, so long as she's not doing anything evil, wrong or bad. And so far, I've seen no evidence of her destroying the country, whether it's in the pandemic or otherwise. So I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, I don't think her influence is malign. Therefore, I'm not going to get too upset about the influence. Can I just point out that I never have conversations with my partner about having problems at work because obviously working for LBC, I never would. Uh, Robert Shrimsley, I'm going to break the habit <laughs> of a lifetime and not come to you last. Um, okay. what, what influence should a Prime Minister's partner have and Carrie Simmons in particular? Well, I mean, I clearly agree with the premise that there's the one person in, in Downing Street who you can absolutely rely on who's in this for you to large measure. Uh, clearly, they should have another person they talk to. They should have an influence and all prime ministerial spouses... Um, have done so. It's also true that um, Carrie Simons is a political operator and has put herself into the line a little bit by getting involved, for example, in the pushing out of the, the Cummings crew and some of the appointments that she's played an active role in. So she's not as background as, say, Philip May was. But I think the fundamental point here is that you have to look at the Downing Street operation, any Downing Street operation, and this one in particular, as rather like a royal court, a Tudor court, and people are battling for the attention of the king or the queen, and they are fighting, and the most powerful currency you have within Downing Street is the ear of the prime minister. And people are fighting for this. And you know, one of the reasons why Dominic Cummings is so vituperative about Gary Simon is because he was losing influence to somebody else. And I, you know, through my... You, through the university, I studied the Tudors, and I watched the sort of the, the, the um, I watched what was happening uh, in the period where Dominic Cummings and, and the Vote Leave crowd being pushed out, and allies of Carrie Symes were being brought in, and it just reminded me entirely of what happened every time Henry VIII tired of one of his wives, you know, and you know, all of the courtiers and all of the powerful families around um, Henry VIII, the Howards or the, whoever it was. They would start finding somebody to push in his direction so that they could regain influence in court. And, and this is what essentially was happening over the last year. And Carrie, Carrie Simons is a person of influence in court. She has helped get other people who share her worldview and who are allies of hers into court and who she thinks would be better for the prime minister into court. And she has pushed out those, helped push out those courtiers who she felt were either bad for him or bad for the country. And I think once you start looking at what goes on in Downing Street through that prism, everything makes a great deal of sense very quickly. Um, There's more David syphilis Living. in Tudor Times, wasn't there? Ooh. I haven't been testing. Good. I'd have to take your word for that, Susie. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Tested in so many ways. Uh, David Liddington. Um, Philip May. Now, he, of course, big background in the Conservative Party. A um, little bit similar to Carrie Simmons in a way. No, nobody believes that he wouldn't have offered his advice to Theresa May at, at, at various points. Um, why is it that a woman always attracts this Lady Macbeth type criticism, which a man never does? I think, I think that, um, as Susie says, there's, there's a... a um, we've, we've got something wrong with your sound, David. We'll, we'll come back to you in a second. Let's go back to our caller, Mike and Beverly. Hello, Mike. Hi, Ian. Hi. What, um, yeah, what's your I, answer I, I to think, your question? My answer to the question is that policy advice, I find absolutely um, no problem at all, um, independent of which sex the spouse is. Where I get a little bit of difficulty is this, where it gets into personal friendships and best friends and don't like him, um, that seems to be getting away from policy and what's best for the country and, and is getting personal friendships and loyalties involved and that bit I don't like. But advice on policies, pointing stuff out and saying you ought to be getting this done, that done, look after the um, old soldiers, that's absolutely brilliant. But first, when it uh gets personal, that's when I, I start to worry about it. OK, Mike, I think we've sorted David's sound. Um, carry on, David. Yeah. No, so I, I, I think um, what Susie said was, was true, that the, there is an element of sexism to this, and I can remember very similar accusations being levelled at Sherry Blair. Um, 
but both Philip May and Dennis Thatcher, um, you know, certainly, you know, talked to their spouses very privately and very frankly, and they had views on the issues of the day. So I mean, every prime minister's husband, wife, fiance, you know, has influence in the way that the the others have said. I mean, what what seems to me to be important is is that you know. Whoever is the prime minister at the end of the day, whichever source of advice they've been listening to, takes a decision um, on, on the basis that as best they can judge, this decision is the one that's going to be most in the public interest. Um, and that it's clear to everybody who has taken a decision, the decision is properly recorded and that there is some sort of system. Uh, that does that. And so everybody, all the civil servants then know, um, OK, that decision's now taken. This is what we've got to go off and do. And it, 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 I think one of the worrying things about the Cummings allegations today was when he was suggesting that uh, decisions were taken by the official process and then there'd be a bit of behind the scenes going on to try and change it after the event. And if that happened, that's clearly not the, uh, the best way to go about taking government decisions. But every every prime ministerial other half has uh, has, has views and has influence okay you see Thank what's you just the... what's david's oh, sorry on, i was just going to point out what david's just said there about the way those processes and those decisions should be made is exactly the answer to mike's question about the the issue if you like because the fact that those decisions don't follow a process, that it's not clear who's in charge, that it's not done in a clear and considerate and transparent and above board kind of fashion, means that the decisions are so chaotic and so mad uh, and done in such a, a hodgepodge, messy manner that therefore whoever is nearest to the prime minister at the time he makes those decisions does matter. Uh, and Cummings evidence today was that he changed his decision quite frequently. And anyone who criticises Carrie Simmons for influencing the prime minister is automatically saying the prime minister is an infant who has to be told what to do and will be told what to do by whoever is closest to him and who is you know, more authoritative or grown up than he is. And it, it just infantilizes the prime minister, it infantilizes any man who, when, when their wife or their woman is told, you know, they're the one who's under their thumb. Um, but I think it's the fact that we have a prime minister who doesn't make the decisions in the way that David just described, which means there's been all this concern about whether Cummings is the influence, whether Carrie is the influence, whether it's the dog, you well, know, it could, probably could I mean, be the dog, who knows, that would explain a lot. Actually, According Ian, to uh, co uh, sorry, co just just before you, Siobhan, um, I think one of the things that Dominic Cummings would 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 point out there is that well, Boris Johnson was making the decisions because he didn't follow the decisions that Dominic Cum Cummings wanted him to. Siobhan, um, I, I I just think that we get sidetracked onto this whole kind of insider process kind of stuff when most voters actually. They, they just want to be able to have a government that's competent enough to allow them to get on with their lives, raise their kids, have a decent education um, and have somewhere decent to live. And I, that kind of, it's that that I just think you have to concentrate on. Okay. It's 10 to 9 on LBC. Let me tell you who's on Cross Question next week. Um, I'm not here on bank holiday, believe it or not, I'm having the day off. Uh, but on Tuesday, we have Paul Mason, uh, the journalist, uh, Ian Birrell, another journalist, uh, Chris Green, Conservative MP for Bolton West, I think it is, and Caroline Flint, the former MP for Don Valley. Uh, Rory Stewart will be joining us on Wednesday with the comedian Jeff Norcott, Peter Tatchell, and the commentator Nadine Bachelor Hunt. Right, let's go to the next question question it's from our very good friend sean in concert hello sean hello mate i'm stutting like i want to know why the reason why we've got to suffer for another year right after losing our loved ones why are we going to suffer another year without getting a, an inquiry into this so you think this it should be brought joke. forward this is an absolute joke this it's it it makes me sick to the stomach to hear them ah oh, you know it's got to take a year it hasn't. It can be done in August. So why does okay. it not get done in August? All right, let's put that to the panel. Um, Robert Shrimsley. Uh, this time you come to me first. Yeah, um, I know. Why have we got... <laughs> 
Um, you know you wanted have we me got to. to wait here? Well, I mean, the, the honest answer to your question, of course, is that the Prime Minister doesn't want the outcome of this pan, this inquiry to happen before the next general election. And given how long public inquiries take, uh, an average of around two years, if it doesn't start till 2022, he's got a decent shot of getting through the next election before um, before the outcome uh, is, is, is made public. That's, that's the simple answer, I think, uh, to your question. He's pushing it back um, as far as he can. I, I would say, I do think... <coughs> There, there, there is a real issue in terms of what we want out of a public inquiry. I think public inquiries are very bad instruments of political revenge and methods of, you know, of bringing down individuals. A lot of time is always passed by the time you get to it. Um, and, you know, some of the specifics are, if the recommendation of the public inquiry is, well, don't make Boris Johnson prime minister during your next pandemic, I mean, the chances are that's not going to happen anyway. So, I mean, I think what you want from these things is a really forensic look at where we went wrong, how we went wrong, what things we should do next time. Because let's face it, this is not the last crisis of its kind our country is going to face. It could be a technological crisis, it could be an environmental crisis, it could be another biological crisis, antimicrobial resistance. There are all kinds of things that could creep up upon us. And we clearly need to be a lot better prepared. A lot of things failed, particularly at the start of this crisis, even before you get into the political culpability of the politicians. So in a way, I, I don't really mind if they give, if it takes too long. What we want is a grown up outcome out of this that makes sure that some of the major issues that, that aren't subject to political vicissitudes can be tackled. David Liddington. Yeah, I agree very much with, with, with the thrust of what Robert said. Um, I think that going around looking for individuals to to blame is, is, is not going to be the best use of an inquiry, which should be focused on what we got wrong and what we got right. Um, genomic analysis, where the UK is now providing about half the world's um, such an, uh, analyses um, and the vaccination program. Uh, and ask you, what changes do we need to make to the way government is organised and run in this country, to the relationship between government and businesses, uh, particularly the pharma and medical companies that were, were of real importance here with government's relationship with science and scientific evidence and how can we do our best to put in place changes that are going to make a difference for the better for the future. I mean, I, I've said already, I, I, I think that this inquiry should be got underway. I think that it, it should not be delayed and, uh, until 2022. Um, the, 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 the reasonable argument for delay is that the people who are actually working on the pandemic at the moment, the officials, the scientists, the politicians, are also the people that you'd be wanting to give evidence at the inquiry. And you do want them focused on the immediate crisis, not on going around looking up papers of the last 18 months to find what they said to whom at what meeting. Um, but I just think the balance of the argument is for going sooner than the government is is currently planning, because I think it, it is really important we learn those lessons as rapidly as possible. Siobhan McDonough. I want the inquiry to start right away, uh, because... Despite uh, what so David much. said just there about the officials' time. Yeah, I think, I think that, that the reason I'm, David was suggesting that that was the opposing argument that is put by Boris Johnson, and I agree entirely with Robert that the reason for delay has nothing to do with those people who are going to be involved in the inquiry and everything to do with the timing of the next general election. But some of the things we need to look at are too urgent to wait. Um, you know, what do we yeah, do yeah. about our health service? We know we don't have enough intensive care beds. How do we organise our hospitals? Do we go ahead and close some of the hospitals that the government is currently proposing to withdraw services? such as my own one in St. Helier, which is going to lose its A&E. Um, what do we do about children on free school meals and how they catch up? What do we do about those kids who don't have access to the internet or a computer at home? Those things are real practical things and they need to be talked about right now. Susie? Um, I think there's this suggestion that if you have an inquiry, it's the full-blown thing. 
and it's not doesn't have to be after hillsborough there was an interim inquiry that was held mm. really quickly which actually produced some very quick results about uh you know safety and seating and stands mm. and so on and so forth there is no reason on you know it took a lot of full inquiries to get to the real bottom of hillsborough over years right and i'm sure that a full inquiry of this would do it would soak up officials time as everyone said but if we had an interim inquiry in the next six months that said, look, how do we achieve parity between the care service and the health service so that they are they have the same level of protection and communication? How do we protect care homes? Who's in charge of infection control in hospitals, which has been bad for decades? Um, how do we, you know, get that on top of that? How do we fix this so it doesn't happen again? How do we control borders? Where is the system for test and trace? Some of these basic underlying things which Cummings was talking about today about how prepared Britain was for pandemics is something that we should do now not only because of the the issues we've had already and because we don't want them to happen again if there are new variants that come in, but because, um, as Robert's paper and many others have reported, there is a a bigger pandemic brewing. You know, we are due a big one that is worse than this at some point in the near future. And we really, another one that probably crosses species barriers, and we need to be ready for that when it happens. It could even happen before a full inquiry is heard. So there's no reason on earth, Sean, in concept, that we can't have an interim inquiry right now and fix these things the reason that we're not sean is because it takes a year to shred all the documents and because as the others have said you know they want to move it oh come on (laughs) and they want to move it past uh the point where they're going to get to near the election um and because you know the only reason that you would delay an inquiry at this stage and not have that interim short sharp quick inquiry to save lives is because saving your own skin is more important and that's what's happening Sean, I'm not going to come back to you because we, we know what you think from the, what you said at the beginning, but thank you very much indeed for your call. Right, a lighter one to end on from Shirley in Bassett Law. Dominic Cummings kept referencing the film Independence Day today, which is one of my favourite films, I have to say. What film would you compare the last 12 months to? Um, there's some great lines in Independence Day, uh, one of which has come to mind, but unfortunately it's two minutes to nine and I could only really quote it after nine, so I'm going to keep that one to myself. Um, Siobhan McDonough, um, are you a film buff? Can you think of one? Not a film buff, but Groundhog Day. Three <laughs> lockdowns, three times delayed, uh, delay and dither over every decision, whether it's uh, locking our borders to India, whether it's deciding about how the GCSE results were going to be assessed, uh, whether it was uh, what was happening in our hospitals and the discharges we've spoken about elderly and vulnerable people to care homes. They didn't just do it once. They did it time and time and time again. Every day was repeated. Robert. Uh, actually, during the during the hearing, I was reminded of a, a, a film, the film Speed, and I had this sense of Dominic Cummings looks to himself and thinks he's Keanu Reeves in Speed. <laughs> I'm the only one who can save this bus. I'm the only one who can save this bus. And somebody had to tap him on the shoulder and say, "Listen, mate, you're actually not the hero of this movie." Um, there are other leads in this film, but I, you had that sense of his, his own sense of I am the hero of my own story. <laughs> um, he hasn't looked in the mirror lately if he thinks he's Keanu Reeves, um, Susie. <laughs> No, he's a tourist on the bus, isn't he? Who can't step out onto the lorry halfway through because he gets too scared. Um, no, partly I thought because we've kind of been abandoned by the authorities and then we're sort of having to govern themselves to this, perhaps something like the Hitchhiker's Guide to Virology, because we've all had to figure that out as we're going and figure out our own risks. But actually, considering the huge amount of resource that's been thrown at saving one man, I've got to say it's more like saving Private Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I say one of the revelations of all this is I never knew we had so many virologists or epidemiologists who love to appear on the media. Uh, David Liddington. Yeah, I'm no film buff either. I mean, we love what Robert was talking about that the you know the, how this was akin to Tudor politics. And I'm tempted to say you know the ad- TV adaptation of Wolf Hall sort of the best uh, <laughs> best best suit. Actually, there's a bit of War of the Worlds about it in terms of um, an unknown unexpected mortal threat that comes in and at the start everybody is in the dark about how on earth they deal with this um and i think that is that it, it, it's watching really really good people struggling to uh, understand and learn from and get on top of a completely novel threat and i find you listen to the scientists and they will admit 
they've made mistakes too. They have learned as we've gone along and what they would believe and say now is probably quite different from what they believed and said in all respects um, 12 months ago. Well, we've that brings us to the end of it. this edition of Cross Question. David Liddington, Siobhan McDonough, Robert Shrimsley and Susie Boniface, thank you very much for joining us. If you missed any of today's episode or you'd like to catch up on previous episodes, you can do so on the Cross Question podcast or on Global Player. And you can watch us again right now on YouTube if you would like to. Well, coming up, we're going to continue the discussion about today's events at the Select Committee. We're going to be taking your calls 0345 6060 973. I'm going to keep it fairly broad. You can phone in on any aspect of this. What has today changed? Because if it hasn't changed anything, it's going to be quickly forgotten. Or do you think this might be the day that signals the beginning of the end for Boris Johnson's premiership? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Matt Hancock has rejected accusations made about him.